We're going to talk about love too, but we've been talking about faith. Faith is a belief about who Jesus is. It's an affirmation of what he taught. It's also an acceptance of the scriptures, which he treated as the authoritative word of God. And faith is also a life, your life, which is founded upon those truths, living according to the truth that that Jesus is our king, where every decision you make and action you take is grounded on your identity and purpose within the story of God. This story most importantly includes God's own son becoming flesh and going to the cross to bear the burden of sin that we all share then rising from the grave in victory and establishing his eternal and never-ending kingdom to which we belong by faith. Yet our faith is under attack. Wouldn't you know it, this is also a part of God's story. This is one of the truths revealed in God's word that the faithful followers of Jesus Christ would be oppressed, would face resistance, resistance from the world around them that remains darkened and the people around them who revel in sin, ignorant of God's grace. Now, while the truths of the gospel remain the same, the kinds of attacks that our faith faces changes based on the attitude or or whims of human society and collective consciousness. And some of the attacks that our faith faces are, are millennia old, Right? The, the charge that faith is unreasonable has been around since the very beginning. We see it being dealt with in Scripture. Others are, are only centuries old, like the attack that our, our faith is anti-science. Faith is the enemy of science. That is, is really only an attack that has been alleged against faith in, in recent centuries. The one we will discuss today is, is really just decades old. And though it is one of the youngest attacks on the Christian faith, it is at the moment its most intense. It is the allegation that nearly every Christian who gets interviewed on television or or other form of media is confronted with. It's the primary reason why there is a popular movement to prohibit Christians from, from taking public roles in government or commerce or education. And it is the most intensely presented attack against faith to our children by their peers, at school, and in nearly every other dimension. It is the attack that faith is unloving or bigoted, especially as it applies to chastity, sexuality, and gender. The attack would allege that people may practice whichever form of sexuality they prefer, may select a gender of preference other than their biological gender, and may engage in sex outside of marriage with whichever number of lovers that they choose, and that any faithful person who would object to any of these behaviors is acting in a way that is unloving or bigoted. Let me attempt to explore the origination of this attack uh, philosophically as arising from a postmodern worldview where the physical, biological realm, that on the bottom of this diagram that I keep showing you over and over, has been separated from the realm of value and consciousness above it. Now, this is specifically true for the issues of of sexuality and gender, uh, it kind of works backwards today on the issue of, of chastity. Uh, actually, it works in reverse. But, but here, let me speak just about sexuality and gender. In the last 70 years of Western civilization, we have seen an elevation to supremacy of the conscious realm, this stuff on top, over the physical, where decisions about value, virtue, and will transcend that of the physical realm, and to such a degree that what is below, what is observable, what is physical, has no determinative value whatsoever. I will bring this into greater clarity in a moment when we see how this philosophical split works its way into a division between the true authentic self on the top and one's body on the bottom. 
as we, as we have discussed uh, at length, this idea of a bifurcated reality where, where what is observable and what is conscious, a, a division between values and facts is, is really a misstep, an error of form. As people of faith, familiar with God's Word and the truths it tells us about the physical universe and its relation to God, we recognize that there is a unity, a oneness between what is right and what is real, between what we observe and what is true. Specifically about ourselves, we recognize that our physical being, our bodies, the form we possess as humans is not a mistake. And it's not the result of historical accidents related to selection, but that we are made by God to be his people, creatures who delight in his glory and share in his image. In fact, this is the first truth revealed to us about ourselves in God's word. In the very opening scene of Scripture, we learn that God created mankind, male and female, not just a part of his masterpiece, but as the centerpiece of what he made, as beings uniquely bestowed with his image, which I maintain is the, our self-conscious will by which we may choose to love, to worship, and act. The creation of mankind is then returned to in Genesis 2, discussed again to emphasize the purpose for which God made us and his design for man and woman as partners, his intention for them to have sex. We are not left to wonder when we open the Bible why we have the bodies that we have. We're not left to wonder why there are some humans with male bodies and some humans with female bodies. We're not left to wonder about the purpose for our sexual organs. Instead, we are told right away in God's Word that these elements have a purpose and a design given to them by their Creator, and that His creation is good. As people of faith, we give glory to God for the way that we are made. Because we know that God is good and that His design for creation is good, that His design for our bodies is good. And we would object to anyone suggesting that God's design expressed clearly here in His Word for man and woman should be in any way overturned. And that precisely is what is being suggested by those who would bring this attack against faith. Let me return to why. The division between values and facts manifests this way. When we talk about human sexuality, when we talk about really the idea of the person at all in our modern world, there is a currently perceived a division between the true self, which, in, which exists in the realm of one's consciousness as distinct from and separated from one's body. So there is a, a split made, and the self on top, one's conscious self is perceived to be private and subjective, meaning I, uh, one cannot argue with someone about what they perceive to be in their own consciousness about their selves. And, and currently in our world, the self is, is where people are encouraged to find truth. That it is their conscious self that determines who they are or what they were supposed to be. And it is separated from their physical body. The body is seen to be accidental. It is a, a product of, of biology or genetics that is outside of one's control. And so it is, it is perceived to be a, an accident that, that could, uh, in, in the best case, be seen as a utility to achieve whatever your consciousness wants, or in a worst case, be seen as an impediment that needs to be changed or disrupted in order to find fulfillment in one's consciousness. Now, this division of self and body leads our world to accept a number of things that are sinful. Uh, from this division, we get things like 
homosexuality, which ignores the physical fittedness of the male anatomy for the female anatomy. It is the victory of, of one's self of a conscious choice over the information that we receive from our bodies. The same is true of transgenderism, which is a reversal of one's, the gender with which one is born, a chromosomal biological gender identity uh, is replaced by whichever one is chosen or elected by one's consciousness. Abortion, as well, is a victory of the self over the body. As a part of one's body or another body within one's womb is terminated because it is not desired by the conscious self. Assisted suicide is another issue that arises from this body self split because one may determine that oneself is enduring uh, too much pain or just dissatisfied with life enough that they are going to terminate their bodily existence. And it does not matter whether or not their body is ready to die or it is time for their body to die. Uh, it is the victory of the self over the body, which is seen as an accident or an impediment. But we cannot agree to these terms. Our bodies are not mistakes. Our bodies are not without value or, or information. Our bodies are made by God for a certain purpose and with a certain design. We are embodied creatures given this flesh by the Creator who in His wisdom deemed it right to do so. This is where our worldview splits from those who would make this attack against faith. See, it is impossible for those who do not share a Christian worldview about reality, it is impossible for those who accept the body-self split to understand why Christians would be so cruel as to declare homosexual behavior and gender reversal a sin. Because their worldview can't make sense of the idea that our physical bodies are anything more than a coincidence. And if indeed, if you go back a step and you accept that your physical body is in fact a coincidence, then they would be right in saying that it is, it is fair for you to choose whichever sexual preference you desire or whichever gender you wish to be assigned. Because our worldviews are split in this way, it is hard for us to have this conversation. We as faithful people often make a mistake in simply confronting these sins without addressing the bigger picture. The bigger picture being our reality is shaped by God's Word and what it tells us about who we are and what we are meant to be. By that I mean if, if all the world hears from faithful people is homosexuality, homosexuality is wrong and transgenderism is wrong, and that's all they hear, they won't be able to make sense of it. It will just seem cruel, and we will have done a very poor job explaining ourselves. A good constructive appeal would require an explanation about the belief you have that God has designed our physical world, that God has designed our bodies, especially the human form. Uh, these things are a result of God's creative will and design. And that this reality about ourselves is what is guiding your moral judgments and leading you to make the, the moral decisions that you're making. We have to start there to make any sense. And there is another really big problem to point out here, one I put on the screen a little too early. So often, our eyes are in the wrong place. So often, we are receiving input and information and influence from this worldview, from uh, different kinds of media that accept the premise that the self is, is something other than one's body, and our hearts are being misled because our eyes are taking in the idea that one's self is, is disconnected from one's body. 
Our hearts are being misled because we are filling our eyes and we are filling our attention with, with people who reject originally the truth that the world and everything in it is God's handiwork, that we are designed and made by God. And I want to caution you here that if you are having trouble accepting the reality of God's word about sexuality and gender and chastity, which in God's word is in no way unclear, if you too think it is cruel for Christians to condemn these behaviors which transgress God's design, then please consider where your eyes have been. Consider what sources you have let fill your heart. If you get your information about sexuality and identity and love from the films you watch, from television on any channel, or from our current culture and society, then you are soaking in the wrong worldview. You are taking in, through your eyes, darkness. If you get your information about sexuality from a, a family member who has accepted this idea that the self is not the body, who has accepted these forms of rejection uh, of God's design for our bodies, then you are soaking in the wrong worldview. And if you are now sitting in, in this room or, or watching w along with us and, and find yourself hesitant to proclaim the truth about God's design presented in His Word, then I want you to examine where your eyes have been. What has filled your attention? I ask you to consider how things would be different if you hadn't seen those shows. If pop culture didn't fill your eyes, if popular opinion did not weigh on your heart, if you didn't listen to that person, how would it be different if you filled your heart and your mind with God's Word first? How would it be different if you paid attention to the truth about God's good creation and His purpose for man and woman? You have to fix your eyes on Jesus, and then your heart will be corrected. Romans 1 is many of the clear, it's one of many. Romans 1 is one of the many clear passages of Scripture that speak against homosexual behavior. And I'd like to open there and read that passage together this morning if you want to open to Romans 1 with me. But I want to go there to point out how it does so. Not as the original problem of mankind or as a sin to be addressed on its own, but in Romans 1, homosexual behavior is addressed as a result of the rejection of the truth about God. It comes up in the course of this chapter as a consequence or a symptom of something else. Our society accepts and practices sexual deviance not because it feels right or seems good, but because they originally have rejected the truth about God in exchange for a lie. And this is the result. Let me just read this passage. I'm going to start in verse 18 of Romans 1, if you want to start reading there with me. Uh, verse 18, uh, Romans 1, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. That is the first step 
Just notice how this appears in sequence. First, they exchange the truth about God for a lie, and then watch what follows. Verse 26, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they do what ought not to be done. I want you to see how this condemnation appears in context, so that you can know that defending our faith from this attack, that these things are right, and that we should not condemn them. Defending our faith from that will require us to accept the truth of God's Word in our hearts. That we will have to make sure that we have not made the mistake that led others to accepting these practices, these lifestyles. That we must accept the truth of God's creation and design completely. It is only when this foundation crumbles, it is only when you and your mind are willing to concede that our body is not designed and purposed by God, that you can be misled and you can be carried away into sin or to approving of those who are sinning. But there is one more thing we must do. Our posture on this issue must not just be one of defending God's truth. We must take the fight to the world as faithful people. If we really do believe that God made our bodies with a purpose and design, and I believe that, do you? If we really do believe that, then we must, as people of faith, use our bodies to worship God by embracing and fulfilling His design. If, God, if God's design is for a man to leave his mother and father and be united to his wife and for the two to become one flesh, then we need to do that well. In truth, the greatest weapon you have against this attack from our wicked world is your marriage. Or if you're single, it is your chastity. I don't think our world will be changed by arguments or picketing, or refusing to bake wedding cakes. Our world will see the truth if you take seriously your God-designed purpose to love your spouse. And in that God-ordained relationship to give and receive love, especially romantic love. Our world will see the truth if faithful singles insist that the proper place for sexual pleasure is in the bond of marriage. Our world will see the truth if our children see affection and respect and devotion shared between their parents. This is not an argument we will win by being cruel or by calling people names. In fact, those who would do that in, in regards to this issue bring great shame to the name of our Savior. The faithful people of God must primarily fight this war in their bedroom and at their kitchen table. If you believe that this is God's design for mankind, then we have to do it with excellence. when our faith is attacked as unloving. When someone would tell you that you're not accepting a, a certain uh, a homosexual lifestyle or transgenderism or, or unchastity for sexual relations, then you must stand firm in the truth that we, including our bodies, were created by God with a purpose and a design. That we are not a, a mistake that our body has something to say about who we are because it was given to us by our Creator. 
We must stand firm knowing that true love rejects evil and falsehood. So when someone insists to you that love means accepting everyone's choices, you can respond with the truth from God's Word that that is not the case, that true love demands truth, and that the truth is the most loving gift you can give to someone. Stand firm knowing that sharing the truth of God's Word gently and with kindness to those who are misled is the most loving thing we can do for them. And then go on the offensive. Then do something about it by living out God's design for your body. Now, if you're a single, that means saving sex for marriage. And for the married, it means sharing love and affection with great enthusiasm and joy. In this way, we worship God with our bodies. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just marvel at and give you praise for your creation, for the way that you have made us in your wisdom to experience the wonderful relationship of marriage and for the gifts that we can exchange with our spouse in that relationship. Dear Heavenly Father, cure our hearts from the symptoms and consequences of the times when our eyes have been filled by darkness. Dear Holy Father, remove from us the influence that would cause us to doubt your word about who we are and who you made us to be so that we can take a stand in strength against the forces of this world who do not accept your truth and do not live according to your word. Dear Heavenly Father, empower us to do this with love and with all the kindness that you have shown us in forgiving us of every sin of ours. We pray this in your name. Amen.